Okay, thank you. Um, I was honored to be invited and I've been looking forward to this opportunity to speak about a topic that I've only been thinking about for a short time, but it's, it's clear to me that it's likely to occupy my, my research uh, interests for uh, quite some time in the future, and that's the uh, question of international governance of climate engineering. Um, now, despite the fancy title, that's really all it is, International Governance of Climate Engineering. But since I gave you the title, I thought I should tell you a little bit about the story of fate, and for those of you who don't know it. Um, Phaeton is a child, it's a, it's a story from Greek mythology, and you can find it in Ovid's Metamorphoses and other places, Greek and Roman mythology. Anyway, Phaeton as a child didn't know his father, and when he became a young man, his mother told him that his father was the sun god, Helios in Greece and Apollo in Roman mythology. Phaeton wasn't sure he believed this, um, but he journeyed to the kingdom of the sun uh, to find out. And sure enough, when he got there, Helios greeted him uh, as his son and welcomed him. But Phaeton said, well, I don't believe you. You know, prove it, basically, as teenagers are wont to do. And Helios said, okay. And to prove his parental affection for Phaeton, he made an unbreakable oath that he would give Phaeton anything he wanted. And Phaeton said, well, I want to drive your chariot for a day. And uh, Helios was horrified at this suggestion, and he proceeded to beg Phaeton to ask for something else. Um, uh, being, he warned Phaeton that even the other gods would never dare uh, to dream of driving his chariot, uh, that it was folly. Uh, Ovid's words in English translation Choose out a gift from seas or earth or skies, for open to your wish all nature lies. Only decline this one unequal ta task, for tis a mischief, not a gift, you ask. But Phaeton was determined. He said, I'm going to ride and drive that chariot. So eventually Helios turned over his chariot after anointing his son with a magic oil that would prevent him from being burned. And, and he urged Phaeton, and I'm not kidding, this is what uh, Ovid says, he urged Phaeton uh, to drive carefully, not too fast, and stay in the middle of the road. Um, well, of course it was a disaster. Phaeton couldn't control the horses pulling the chariot. First they climbed too high and the earth began to freeze. And then when Phaeton dropped the reins, the horses dove to the ground and they veered up north. They melted the polar ice cap, releasing the monster in the ice cap. Then they went over the mountain ranges and melted the snow and glaciers in the Pyrenees and the Alps and the Caucasus. And then they swooped down over the rivers and dried up the rivers and lakes. And then they went over the sea and killed the fish at the top and drove the god of the sea to the bottom. Um, then they went over the plains where the crops were about to be harvested and burned up all the crops. And then Ovid says, but these are trivial ills. He says, whole cities burned and people's kingdoms into ashes turned. So finally, the goddess of the earth begged Zeus to do something about this kid who was running amok and, uh, and ruining the earth. And uh, Zeus did. He eventually threw a thunderbolt, struck Phaeton from the chariot, caused the chariot to crash, and the disaster was over. Helios went and hid, and in various stories of the myth, the earth was dark for anywhere from one to four days because the sun never came out again. Um, but eventually, uh, Zeus persuaded Helios to return to the sky in his chariot. And that's the story. Now, when I ran across this myth, I thought it was an absolutely irresistible allegory for climate change and for what our, uh, our society is doing to the climate and why we're doing it. Uh, we're like the stubborn and determined teenager, Phaeton, uh, 
We insist on continuing on the path we've determined for ourselves, despite the huge risks of catastrophe that we're told about. We insist on doing it because, well, we want to do it. You know, I want to drive your chariot. I want to do what I want to do. And one might think that the ancient storytellers were prophets. So accurately uh, did they describe the likely consequences of our modern folly. Melting glaciers and polar ice, burning cities, devastated crops, disappearing fresh water, and wounded oceans. It's an amazing allegory. But the story serves equally well, maybe even better is an allegorical warning about an increasingly discussed solution to climate change, uh, and that is geoengineering. Despite warnings from Helios that only Helios, not even the other gods, um, could control the untethered forces of nature, despite being told that he was undertaking a risk that even the other gods would not attempt, Phaeton was convinced in his hubris that he could keep a tight rein on his father's chariot and he could direct it where he would. And the consequences for Phaeton, I never know how to pronounce it, I apologize, ultimately was death at the behest of an outraged and devastated world. So that's the story. And that's the allegory. And tonight I want to talk to you, with you about the climate engineering solution or the geoengineering solution to climate change, um, about the pro challenges it poses for international policy. I'm a lawyer, not a scientist. Scientists would talk to you about the technical challenges. I want to talk to you about the policy challenges it poses and whether we um, will be able to govern uh, the forces of nature, uh, the scientists unleashed, in a way that serves rather than defeats our purposes. Oh, I keep, I forget, I have slides. Sorry. We're going to go backwards one. Because you need to see Phaeton. There he is taking off, and there he is after Zeus decided it was ending. Um, and there's what the, the, the poet says. Greatly he failed, but greatly he dared. Um, so what is geoengineering? Come on. People debate the definition, and, and some people debate what practices should be considered geoengineering or not. This is the basic definition I think that works. Uh, geoengineering is the deliberate large-scale modification of Earth systems for the purpose of counteracting climate change. The preferred term that's developing is climate engineering, and I don't know if that will catch on, but that's what the, what the scientists are wanting us to call it. Um, there are two primary categories of techniques. Uh, one is carbon dioxide removal and sequestration, um, which also is called remediation technologies, technologies that, that take the carbon out and try to reduce the concentrations of, of greenhouse gases in that way. And the other techniques are solar radiation management, techniques that design to counteract, not to change the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, but to reduce the amount of energy that gets into the atmosphere as a way of keeping the, uh, keeping the climate uh, cool. Um, I'm sorry, I've got to... So this slide, I know it's hard to see. You can find it on the web, that's where I found it. It's just a slide of a, several of the different techniques uh, that people are, are talking about. Each of these techniques has different challenges, different cost factors, different advantages or disadvantages. And I want to talk about just a couple of them in particular uh, because they're, they're the ones that are most frequently talked about as potentially realistic solutions. 
on the um, CO2 removal side on a planetary scale. One of the things that's talked about uh, as being quite feasible, although recent experiments suggest that maybe it isn't as feasible as people thought, is ocean fertilization. It's well known that in different parts of the ocean there's much, a lot less phytoplankton than, than would be expected given the nutrients in that part of the ocean. And the suspicion is it's because of, a, of the absence of a particular nutrient, iron. Uh, so there's a belief that if you fertilize the ocean with, that, with iron, or fertilize these parts of the ocean with iron, uh, you'll get a lot more algae, a lot more phytoplankton, and that will absorb carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and sequester it in the ocean as the, as the dead algae or the dead animals that ate the algae uh, sink to the bottom. Uh, the scientists who first initiated this idea said something along the lines of, give me a hundred million dollars and I can give you an ice age. Um, so he was quite sure uh, that uh, ocean fertilization could work a, a major uh, change in the, in the planetary system. Uh, so that's frequently discussed. There are several other methods of removing um, carbon dioxide, uh, are to especially uh, genetically engineered plants and trees, um, uh, forestry practices, biochar, there's a number of different things that would fall in the category of bioengineering. In the category of solar radiation management, uh, we're talking about anything that causes the earth to reflect more sunlight away so that less gets in. And it, it, the proposals range from putting mirrors up in space, hugely expensive, to uh, the one that's most frequently talked about, um, putting sulfur into the stratosphere, sulf in the form of aerosols, to make the stratosphere more reflective. And that's pretty cheap, send up airplanes and dump it in. Um, uh, and there are other things, uh, painting the roofs of houses white, you know, a number, all, all sorts of other proposals for uh, increasing the Earth's albedo in one way or another to increase its reflectivity and decrease the amount of energy that gets into the planet. Uh, many, all of these techniques are under discussion. Each of them has their, their own champion, uh, their own people uh, working on them. Why consider this? Why are people considering this? Well, first, climate crisis. We're facing, I believe, I suspect several of you believe, we are facing a climate crisis. Every year, the evidence grows stronger that the Earth is warming and that this warming is causing climate changes. Global data just for last year, for 2010, shows that 2010 tied 2005 as the hottest year since record keeping began in 1880. It was also the wettest year. Arctic ice in December 2010 was at its lowest level for December since satellite pictures started being taken. Um, I, I guess I said this, I'm getting mixed up. It was the wettest year in the historical record, which is entirely consistent with predictions that a warming earth will increase the intensity of the hydrological cycle. There were especially powerful snowstorms, as you know, in the U.S. and in Europe. Uh, Pakistan endured an unprecedented and really horrifying um, floods and rain. There was also flooding in Australia and California. None of that's uniform. On the other hand, in the Amazon, they had their driest summer or driest year uh, in decades. On the oceans, the die-off of the coral reefs continued and intensified, something that uh, most scientists attribute to warming and acidification in the ocean. Uh, so we've got tremendous evidence that this problem is not, um, is intensifying um, and, and is reaching a crisis 
proportion, past scientific predictions about how fast these things would happen have proven to be conservative, not over predictions, but under predictions. So change is happening faster than we thought, and it, and it also appears that some of the consequences might be more severe than we thought. Uh, and those consequences are very frightening indeed. I, you know, I'm sure most of you have heard of them, but I'll just ma mention a couple of the, of the concerns that are primary when we think about this. First of all, projected sea level rise, not in the short term, but over the long term, we hope, uh, will displace millions of people from their homes or cost billions of dollars to build the sea walls and the other things to protect those homes. Uh, the effect will be the most severe in some of the poorest countries of the world, like Bangladesh, and in small island nations, which might disappear altogether. Uh, changes in precipitation and temperature patterns are going to affect agriculture and food production worldwide with significant adverse impacts on food security and uh, rural economies in many parts of the world. And, and all these changes are also likely to create, in the long run, um, large population movements as environmental refugees move from one place to another and in parts of the world with weak governments um, and uh, not very much money, we can expect that the political stress, including wars and mass killings, um, will be a reality as that, as that happens. Um, we are, in addition, closing in on certain tipping points, uh, at points at, be, at which climate change could intensify because of feedback effects that it induces in the planet and after which the job of getting back to where we were will be that much more difficult. Uh, so we face in the minds of many, me included, a crisis. People know what must be done. We have to cut greenhouse gases soon and rapidly and people know how to do it, but sadly, we failed to do it. Uh, and that's the second reason climate, change, uh, climate engineering is on the horizon. Uh, our diplomats, our diplomatic efforts, the international community, but also our own domestic political system, has been unable or unwilling to, to take this, to address this problem in a way that looks to be both serious and effective over the long term. So those two things combined, a looming crisis situation and a continuing diplomatic failure uh, to, get, to come to grips with that situation, are primarily responsible for increasing talk uh, about uh, geoengineering uh, as a solution. Uh, in addition, you've got the fact that it's potentially less costly um, than reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, and finally, uh, the argument that uh, even if it's not a sensible long-term solution, it might be a viable uh, solution for quick deployment um, as we work on a long-term solution. Um, but for that to work, of course, we have to do the research and planning uh, now. Now, uh, all of you are here, so you're probably not uh, surprised, um, well, I'm sorry, no, I, I'm getting ahead of myself. So what's the other side of the coin? So that's the coin, the, the offer that people make for uh, geoengineering as a solution. What's the other side of the coin? Well, first, there's the moral hazard issue. If we start talking about climate engineering and people think, oh, geez, for a fraction of the cost, we can shoot sulfur into the atmosphere and cool the earth that way, uh, then you're going to weaken the incentive, maybe for the better, maybe not, I won't judge, you're going to weaken the incentive to do the harder thing, which is reduce and get control of greenhouse gases. Second, geoengineering, all the geoengineering proposals pose certain risks, some of them unpredictable, some of them predictable, 
I'll take the two that I was talking about, iron fertilization and uh, sulfate aer aerosols. Uh, iron fertilization will increase phytoplankton growth. That's the hope. That's how it's supposed to work. Assuming it does work, that sounds pretty good. Um, but there is a risk of some significant alteration of the marine ecosystem, which might or might not be positive. Phytoplankton are the, the foundation of the food chain in the marine environment, so maybe more phytoplankton means a healthier marine environment. Uh, maybe it doesn't. Krill, which are little, little tiny um, shrimp-like critters that are very important as, to the marine environment, especially in the Southern Ocean, um, feed on phytoplankton, so increasing the amount might help them. On the other hand, krill lay their eggs or have their, their uh, offspring born just below the surface of the ocean. And if the phytoplankton decay and use up all the oxygen, that could upset the breeding of the krill and wipe out their populations. We don't know which way it will go. Uh, so it could be positive, it could be negative. Uh, the point is that there's a risk of a significant impact on the ecosystem uh, that we aren't able wholly to predict. Um, take the uh, problem of, or the possibility of injecting sulfate aerosols into the atmosphere. We know from observing volcanoes and volcanic activity that doing that will have a cooling effect. Uh, and if we can keep it up over a long enough period of time, you'd have to occasionally re-inject every couple of years. Uh, you could counteract, in theory, the uh, climate change. But we also know that w this will have a weather impact. Uh, it might disrupt uh, traditional rain patterns to some countries, uh, causing the monsoon to disappear and the crops to wipe out. Um, it could increase the rain in other areas, causing of flooding and other, other problems. Um, and it may do things that we can't at this point predict because we don't have full uh, knowledge and understanding of how the sulfate aerosols interact um, in the atmosphere. Uh, so there are problems and risks, and those, deter those in, uh, in the minds of some are reason enough by themselves uh, not to pursue a climate engineering solution. Uh, and finally, we have to recognize, even if we do pursue it, that in many cases it would be an incomplete solution, especially solar radiation management, which does nothing about acidification um, in the oceans and moreover has to be maintained over a long period of time or you'll have, or you run the risk of dramatic and sudden warming if you stop doing it, warming if you stop doing it. So uh, these are incomplete solutions. So are they serious, or are, meaning the people who talk about this, serious? Well, you bet, absolutely, and more so every day. Here's a list of just a few of the groups in the last three years that have come out in support of at least research and perhaps real world experiments with various kinds of climate engineering. The Royal Society in the United Kingdom in 2009 endorsed it. The National Academy of Sciences in the US in 2010 endorsed it. A conference at Asilomar um, on climate engineering in 2010, which had representatives of uh, academics, government, and NGOs, uh, came out in support. Uh, a U.S. House committee and a U.S. parliamentary committee have been holding um, hearings on the issue uh, to decide whether they should come out in support. Leading climate scientists, including several Nobel Prize winners, uh, have advocated in favor of climate engineering. Entrepreneurs are coming out of the woodwork. There are several companies that have patents on various ocean fertilization techniques. They, of course, would love to see us uh, pursue this. Uh, Bill Gates is rumored, but in the legitimate press, to be privately supporting 
climate engineering activity and investing in high-tech climate engineering companies. Uh, and the climate change skeptics, this is perhaps the greatest irony of all. The climate change skeptics, many of whom say we don't have, understand the atmosphere enough uh, to know whether climate change is really happening, are now saying we don't have to do anything about climate change because if it is really happening, we'll be able to engineer the atmosphere to counteract it. Um, so, uh, I, I think that um, uh, you'll see this in, in, in much of the literature. Uh, so, we've got really, um, how do I put it? Well, I'll come back to that. We've got, a bit, but we do have a, a lot of interest in this um, and a lot of forward momentum um, to, to do the fundamental research and maybe even the actual experiments necessary uh, to see whether any of these techniques will work. Well, that raises some absolutely critical questions of governance. If we're going to move forward with climate engineering, we need to start thinking about some essential questions, and that's where, that's where my legal research is aimed. Uh, one obvious question, who chooses the methods? You know, we, we don't necessarily want ten different people all trying to cool the atmosphere by two degrees through their own individual methods. Um, we, might, we might find that the cooling gets a little more than anticipated. So, who chooses the methods? Who regulates their use? We don't know that. Who bears the cost? Who pays for the damage if there is damage, unanticipated damage? And maybe the most fundamental question of all, who controls the thermostat? If we discover that we can select our temperature, who gets to pick? We need to begin thinking about these questions, in my opinion, very, very seriously, and we need to develop answers quickly, because the bandwagon is starting to roll, or, you know, if you'll forgive me, um, Phaeton's chariot is beginning its ascent. What does international law have to say about this at the present day? Different techniques involve different parts of the environment, and so there are various international laws that might apply, different laws for ocean fertilization than to shooting things in the atmosphere. I want to speak more generally about what international law generally says about uh, climate engineering or geoengineering? And the answer is not really a heck of a lot. Um, there are some I I international agreements that are marginally relevant. After the United States tried to alter the climate in Vietnam during the Vietnam War to cause lots of rain over the Ho Chi Minh Trail and render it unusable, um, the international community uh, entered into a, a convention on the prohibition of military or hostile use of environmental modification techniques. Uh, that convention might have some principles applicable to this situation, except that it's very carefully written, so it only applies to hostile use of environmental modification, and, and these would not be hostile uses within any meaning of the term in that convention. In 1980, the UN Environmental Program adopted some environmental modification guidelines in 1980, but those guidelines have sat for the last 30 years, basically ignored um, and not developed, and in any event, they are styled as recommendations only, and they don't do much more than um, 
repeat certain prin basic principles of customary international law that would be applicable in any event, so they don't help. Uh, the World uh, Meteorological Organization just updated this summer its statement on and guidelines on weather modification. Uh, so I went and I read that, and they say not one word about the governance issue. It's all focused on technical and uh, research issues. Uh, so none of these uh, international rules that m are, or documents that are marginally related actually address the governance issues or even establish a framework in which to raise the issues of, of governance in, in this area. As I said, for particular techniques, there are treaty regimes that might be applicable. The UN Convention on the Law of the Sea will have something to say about ocean fertilization. Uh, the, the Treaty on Long Range Transboundary Air Pollution has some relevance to uh, uh, the possibility of putting sulfate aerosols into the atmosphere. Um, but the legal scholars who've researched these things have pretty much reached the conclusion that even these potential sources of regulatory rules don't provide any real governance to these activities. At, at best, they impose a requirement that no harm be done, but without any particular ability to enforce that requirement or monitor the activities. On the other hand, um, there are some basic principles of international environmental law um, that, that set fundamental parameters that are likely to shape any future governance system. So I want to say a little bit about those principles because I think they'll guide uh, the international community as it moves forward. Uh, there are certain basic duties in international environmental law that are, that are well um, respected and widely adhered to. One is the duty to notify, consult, and cooperate um, for a country to notify and consult and cooperate with other countries if it's engaged in or authorizing activities that could have a tra significant transboundary impact. And the climate engineering would certainly fall within the category of activities that could have a significant transboundary impact. Another obligation, maybe a little less accepted as truly obligatory, is the obligation to assess the environmental impact of activities you engage in. Most countries have domestic laws requiring environmental impact assessment, but there are a lot of fights domestically about when they apply and how much assessment is required. The international community similarly requires environmental assessment. Um, but uh, the the treaty uh, that there the treaties that require this aren't universal, and um, customary law arguably requires it, um, but perhaps not with the strength one would would hope. But nonetheless, that's a principle that uh, is likely to impact thinking about regulating climate engineering. <laughs> that, that climate engineering activity should be subject to some form of environmental assessment before it occurs rather than after it occurs. Uh, there's an obligation to share information. Um, and in the climate area, that's a pretty strong obligation because of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. And there is an obligation to avoid significant transboundary harm, about which I will speak more uh, later. Uh, an obligation that is uh, frequently invoked, uh, but in the environmental arena, not so frequently applied. One sometimes hears uh, non-governmental organizations that are opposed to uh, geoengineering argue, argue that it violates principles of international law. Um, they rely heavily on the notion that transboundary harm uh, should be avoided and on the precautionary principle. 
Uh, I have quite a different view of the situation. I think general international environmental law is not hostile to geoengineering in principle. Um, in, indeed, I think um, there are some arguments to be made uh, that it's, it's a solution that international environmental law would encourage us to pursue. And I just want to lay that case out briefly because I think it's important in understanding how the international community might respond to this. In international environmental law, like it or not, people come first, not nature. It's about people. It is not about nature. That was clear in 1972 in the Stockholm Declaration, which says man, read people, has the fundamental right to adequate conditions of life in an environment of equality that permits a life of dignity and well-being. And he bears a solemn responsibility to protect and improve the environment. It's not about the environment for the environment's sake. It's about the environment for human sake. And that's an important theme throughout international environmental law. The Rio Declaration used different language, but the principle of sustainable development is the same principle. Yes, environmental protection is good, but it has to be balanced against our right to develop and use the environment for human purposes, and we combine those through the concept of sustainable development. The Stockholm Declaration went even further on this along these lines when it talked about technology. Stockholm Principle 18 said that the role about, on the role of science and technology said that they must be applied to the identification, avoidance, and control of environmental risks and the solution of environmental problems. And, and, and that, is a, that is a line that a geoengineer must love. Uh, that you need to use technology to control uh, these risks and avoid these problems. Finally, there's the precautionary principle. And this is where um, people who are concerned about geoengineering and want to argue that international law prohibits it tend to hang their hat, the precautionary principle. The precautionary principle says when risks are too high, caution is appropriate. And the fact that you're not sure about the outcome of the risk isn't a reason for failing to take action. Usually that's used as an argument for banning chemicals. Even though you don't know how bad they really are, you should ban them because they might cause harm. And that's how people think of it. So the Swedish Society of, uh, for the Conservation of Nature, which is the NGO, one of the NGOs that is strongest against geoengineering, has said that geoengineering flies in the face of precaution, uh, techniques that alter the composition of the atmosphere or the chemistry of the oceans are likely to have unintended consequences and therefore pursuing those techniques would violate the precautionary principle. I don't, you know, really think that's an entirely uh, accurate reading of the principle. So I've put the principle on the board here. It starts out, well, where there are threats of serious or irreversible damage, Lack of full scientific certainty shall not be used as a reason for postponing cost-effective measures to prevent environmental degradation. One could read that as an argument for climate engineering as easily as one can read it as an argument against. You know, the, climate crisis is presenting us with threats of serious or irreversible damage. We might not know all we would like to know about climate engineering, but we do know it's cheap and it could help us stop this crisis. And so the precautionary principle would say, go ahead. 
It's a matter of how much you weigh the risks of the climate change against the risks of climate engineering, um, in part. The, yeah, please. And the, the Climate Change Convention, I've got to tell you, the Climate Change Convention itself is, effect, is to the same effect. Uh, Article 3.3, which is part of the principles in the Climate Change Convention, so it's non-binding, it's just guidance for action. The party should take precautionary measures to anticipate, prevent, or minimize the causes of climate change and mitigate its adverse effects. Well, what is solar radiation management but a mitigation of the adverse effects of rising greenhouse gas con concentrations by reducing the amount of heat that gets into the system? Where there are threats of serious or irreversible damage, which we've been telling people there are <laughs> with climate change, serious threats of serious or irreversible damage. Lack of full scientific certainty about the solutions, I guess, should not be used as a reason for postponing such measures, including measures to mitigate those risks. Taking into account that policies and measures should be cost effective, just if you needed one other reason to pursue climate engineering. Um, many of the cost estimates are far lower than the estimates of, of um, uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions uh, through regulation. So what are the options for action that we have? We could have a new treaty. That's my favorite, and I'll tell you why in a couple of minutes. We could have governance within the UN Framework Convention. It's already on climate change. It's already got a governance structure. It's got nearly universal adherence. It has provisions for scientific research and effort. It, it seems the logical place to, to govern climate engineering, and many people have advocated that. I don't, and, and I'll tell you why in, in brief. Um, first of all, um, it appears to be dysfunctional. The consensus decision-making process that's used has been, for several years now, an abject failure, or at least that's my view. Uh, we've made no progress. The requirement that any decisions that are made have to be adhered to by ratification before they're binding on anyone, uh, means that even when we can reach a consensus on something like the Kyoto Protocol, any country that gets cold feet, like the U.S., can back out. Um, and on the geoengineering point in particular, although NGOs have been calling for the, U, for the UNFCC parties in their meetings to say something, anything, about this, uh, there's been, as far as I can tell, deathly silence in any official words coming out of the UNFCC. Uh, so I, I just don't see any hope for that body, though I hope and wish uh, I were wrong. Um, we could have a coalition of the willing. And this is what I fear we'll get, and it's a scary proposition. Um, it will certainly allow research to go ahead, but I do not think that it will address in any way some of the fundamental justice issues involved here that I want to talk about in a minute. And then finally, maybe even more scary, is the prospect that governments will stay out of this entirely in a formal way and that they will leave it to the industrial, academic, government research complex uh, to decide what to do about this. And the scientists around the world talk to each other, they work together, they secure funding together, and they will pursue this, uh, if not stopped. Or, and if, I don't want to stop them, but I would love to regulate them, 
because I fear that scientific curiosity and scientific hubris being what they are, uh, they're just too powerful forces uh, to, in this, to leave, they are too powerful for us to leave the regulation of planet changing forces in their hands and say, you guys decide what to do. Um, however we govern geoengineering, whatever structures we use, whether it's a new treaty or the UNFCC or a coalition of the willing, um, I think for me the fundamental issue, at least one of them, the one I want to talk about because I think it's so important, is the issue of environmental justice and how to structure uh, the governance system uh, to uh, promote um, environmental justice. Uh, I'm not confident that this will happen, um, but I think it's what it should happen. And uh, my research is oriented to trying to figure out recommendations that might help in that direction. What do I mean about environmental justice? Well, I want to start with a quote from the Asilomar Conference. This was the conference of scientists and NGOs and others that advocated proceeding with geoengineering uh, research. Uh, the conferees made the point, although they said we should go ahead, that these large-scale experiments will unavoidably carry some risk of harm to some groups. And it's in that context I want to think about the question of justice. And I think it has two components. Component one, if there are benefits and if there are burdens, if there are harms, they should be equitably distributed. We can fight about what equitable means. But I can guarantee you, if we fight about it and argue about it, we will reach a better and more equitable result than if we ignore it. Um, second, the people, the groups that are facing the risk of harm um, ought to be allowed to participate meaningfully in the decisions that are going to impose harm upon them. Um, that's what I mean by uh, environmental justice. Um, and just stating it, I think, I hope, makes you realize how difficult it will be to achieve. Even domestically, I would venture to say, 90% of the time, within our own country, if an activity has serious environmental harm, that it's going to be structured so that that harm falls on the poor and the powerless. Not on you and me, because we know how to fix it, but on the people who don't know what to do about it. Internationally, that problem is even more severe. And that's because of, of, I think, of two fundamental barriers to environmental justice in the international arena that are structural, that are built into the system, and therefore have to be thought about seriously and addressed directly. One barrier is political. It's the nature of the sovereign state system. The sovereign state system is fundamentally poorly designed to deal with situations where the action within one country has deleterious effects somewhere else. And the reason it's poorly designed is this. I'm sure you've all heard that, right? All politics are local. When our political leaders make a decision, and I'll exaggerate a little, but I don't think much, they do not give a whit what happens to somebody who's not a voter. Right? And if we're talking about geoengineering, disrupting the monsoon in India by the experiments we commit in the U.S., well, our political leaders are unaccountable to the people whose lives they're disrupted. They don't care about them or think about them because they don't vote. 
and they're beholden to an insular electorate that also I have to tell you, by and large, and I'm guilty of this as anyone, cares mostly about how things affect themselves and not very much about how things affect someone else. So let's suppose, just do a thought experiment with me. Our geoengineers say, we think that the sulfate aerosol in the atmosphere solution is going to work. We want to try an experiment to see what happens. We also think we know, because we've seen how volcanic eruptions disrupt weather patterns, that if we inject the sulfate aerosols here, they're going to cause a failure of the rainfall there. And we have our choice. We can inject them here, and the rain's not going to fall all summer over the Corn Belt. Or we can inject them here, and the rain's not going to fall all summer over Ethiopia. Where are they going to inject the sulfate aerosols? This, assuming this conversation is taking place with U.S. politicians behind closed doors. I can tell you, it's, they're not going to inject them where they wreck the lives of their constituents. And it's a fundamental problem with the international system. It's a fundamental problem with the sovereign state system that the people make, that, that the problems have gotten so big that these major decisions have profound impacts on people who have no voice. It's, it's, um, it is, how would I say it? It's a frightening modern version of taxation without representation. So that's the first problem, structural problem with the international solution system. The second problem is that the system is weak. We wouldn't really have to worry that much about uh, politicians only being beholden to their own constituents and not caring about the impact they have if the international system was able to enforce the rule that you shall not cause significant transboundary harm. That is, if the international system had a strong enough central government or a strong enough and well enough honored judiciary that if harm was caused to Ethiopia by sulfate aerosol experiments in the U.S., the U.S. had to pay compensation. If we had that kind of system, then political leaders would be forced by the risk of paying compensation in the future to take into account the consequences that they might impose on others. But we don't have a strong enough international system to do that. In fact, the system has really, there's no evidence that it is functionally capable of imposing liability for transboundary environmental harm. Uh, the Chernobyl explosion in Russia is the, is the prime example that caused huge problems of transboundary radiation. Um, millions of dollars, at least, of damage to other countries. Um, no country made a demand on Russia to compensate, many of them saying because they didn't think they had a legal basis to do so. Even if they had, they probably recognized that they would not uh, recover. Uh, there is no international court with compulsory jurisdiction. The International Court of Justice has jurisdiction over those countries that have consented to its jurisdiction. They can withdraw their consent, and some, like the United States, have. Um, so it's, it's, re it's a fundamentally weak uh, legal system, uh, and that makes the system unable to ensure that those externalities are addressed. In the international system, the polluter does not pay, even though the principles say that the polluter should pay. Um, 
So for me, the question is, if we're going to try climate engineering, we need to build a structure that addresses this weakness, that ensures that the, in decision making, the interests of others are taken into account. And for me, more critically, that ensures that those who are injured are compensated in some way or another. And my thoughts on this are uh, preliminary. That would be an understatement <laughs> to say they're preliminary, but I'll just share a couple of them. Uh, and they'll seem pretty obvious. First of all, I think we need global governance in a real way. We can't have a UN framework convention situation where we've all agreed on a set of relatively meaningless rules and that any effort to implement those rules in a formal, effective way requires another round of unanimous consent or consent from all the parties we're seeking to bind. If we, if, if we don't put in place decision-making mechanisms that bind countries even when they don't agree, uh, then I don't think we're, we're going to uh, have an effective governance system for this. Uh, there are uh, models of international organizations with decision-making authority. The International Monetary Fund is a great example. Um, it, has a, it has the capacity of making significant decisions less now than it used to be because its area of operation has been narrowed. But it has the capacity of making significant decisions and it uses a weighted voting system uh, that ensures that um, countries are, can be outvoted. Um, but is structured in such a way that coalitions of countries can block action from being taken and that causes them to feel like their fundamental interests are protected. So we do have models that we, we, we could follow in creating a, a, a binding decision-making authority uh, at the international level. The second thing I think that we have to do is decide in advance that we're going to compensate um, people, communities, countries that are harmed by climate engineering experiments or climate engineering action. Um, and make sure that we have funding in place to provide that compensation. This is not an easy thing to do, but it can be done. In the areas of oil pollution and nuclear damage, there are international agreements that require the operators um, to buy insurance up to a certain amount to ensure that there's financial monies available in the event of a nuclear accident or an oil spill, and then provide for governments to top it up uh, to meet the damage. These treaties also determine what kind of damage is compensable, and that's something that will need to be done. Um, another model is what we've used here in the U.S. now first for the 9-11 disaster and then for the Gulf oil disaster. <laughs> a model in which a whole bunch of money is just put on the table and, uh, and a neutral party is given the authority to hand it out. Um, under the first model, um, the party that would hand it out would be domestic courts. That might work because in most nations of the world, the governments are obliged to follow what the courts say. So if you uh, left it to the domestic courts to decide what damages were compensable, um, then the governments would very, be pretty likely to follow that, more likely than they would be to follow an international court's decree, frankly. Uh, so we need that liability and uh, compensation system. Uh, so that's where my research is going on this, the things I'm thinking about. I, I think this is a, um, likely to be a very important uh, problem um, within the decade. Um, so, what about Phaeton's chariot? Um, perhaps there's reason to hope. <laughs> I've got to tell you. 
So Ovid told a gloomy story about Phaeton, but that was not the last word. In uh, Ayn Rand's 1957 novel, Atlas Shrugged, if, if any of you are familiar with this novel, one of the uh, transcendent and unappreciated geniuses who abandoned the world and went to live in, in the utopia of geniuses um, was a composer named Richie, Richard Halley who wrote one great work. And the title of his work was Phaeton. And um, as maybe you can guess, in Halley's opera, um, Man Triumphs, Phaeton reigned in the chariot and, uh, and rode it successfully uh, across the sky. Um, I think uh, it's close to inevitable that we are going to fly Phaeton's chariot. Um, we have to hope that Rand's optimistic and utopian modern mythology uh, turns out to be more prophetic than Ovid's kind of gloomy and fatalistic ancient vision. Thank you. I thought about that, and I wrote it like three or four different ways. <laughs> then I abandoned it altogether and used my Ayn Rand versus Ovid. Um, <laughs> but I, I, um, I am pessimistic. Today, I'm pessimistic. I, 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 we continue to um, fail to treat the problem seriously as a society. Individuals treat it seriously, but as a society we continue to fail to treat the problem seriously. And I'm not a scientist, but if the scientists are to be believed, and, and, I, th and I do read a lot of it, and, and the opinion seems fairly overwhelming, if the scientists are to be believed, we're very darn close to the point of no return. Uh, to the point at which we're not going to be able to stop rapid warming and climate change by reducing greenhouse gas emissions. The concentrations are going to be high enough and it's going to take centuries for them to reduce that we're not going to be able to um, uh, reverse the process except by some form of uh, climate engineering. I mean, I'm, I'm, but you know, I'm just one guy <laughs> reading what a bunch of other people write, so. <laughs> Well, my concern is uh, with the effects on people. But I think, I mean, I think any governance system you put in place is going to have to pay attention to the effects on, on biodiversity um, of, of these projects. In the, it's, gonna, it's going to have to be a governance system that assesses all the risks of the activities and tries to make a determination about whether to go forward with experiments, then you learn more, and then, and then with actually actual deployment. Um, and I'm sure the concerns about biodiversity would, would work into it if we have a governance system um, that can be effective. I, I'm not, I don't know if that answers the question. I mean, in the end, I think it's, it's always, it, it, it's, no, I don't mean always. In the end, I think it has to be a comparison. You know, what are we risking if we don't take this action versus what are we risking if we do? And, um, and you have to consider the biodiversity impacts and the human impacts of, of all the options. Then the last thing I'll say, but in, in so far as international environmental law is concerned, 
uh, for good or for ill, people always win. <laughs> nature is protected, but nature is protected for the sake of people um, in, in most international environmental law. Bill Gates could do it. He could do the sulfate aerosols at least one time. Yeah, some of these things are quite inexpensive, inexpensive enough that an individual nation could do them, inexpensive enough that, you know, your James Bond um, rich guy could do them. Um, and that's a concern that I didn't mention because it just didn't fit in. <laughs> but it's a major concern that if we don't figure out a governance structure, then we're going to have unilateral activity eventually. I mean, imagine you are an island nation that just sees the shoreline creeping up and cre or sees the sea level creeping up and creeping up and says the, the world's going to do nothing for us. Maybe at some point you do it for yourself. Um, so, yeah, they're inexpensive enough that they could be undertaken by individual nations, some of them by individual nations, or even by people. Some of them, like the mirrors in space, <laughs> never. That's hugely expensive and too technical, but flying a plane up into the atmosphere and spraying sulfate aerosols around, not so bad, expensive. You, yeah, yeah, and I'm not sure I know the answer. I, I think I understand your question. Um, and I think I've thought about it, you know, how do I convince people to think, of, how do I explain these issues to people, convince them to think about them seriously and carry on a dialogue with them. Um, and, I, in my, and in my personal life, I taught a freshman seminar, you know, the one credit things on climate change. And at the end of it, I asked, them, how many of them were worried about it? And it was so disappointing. You know, I spent 14 weeks with these students, and two thirds of them said, oh, it'll take care of itself. So I have absolutely no answer <laughs> to the question. I don't even know how um, to um, motivate or explain. Um, to college students, even to my own family. 